Right, it's my pleasure to introduce Simon Rogers. He's the Vice President of Digital Solutions at Yokogawa. Simon graduated from Imperial College at London. And uh, after that, he worked for KBC and then M3 as a Vice President and then a Director of Oil and Gas at Quintic. He's now a board member of KBC, which is a Yokogawa company. Uh, at Yokogawa, he was a managing director in the UK and Ireland for about three years. And now for seven years, he's been vice president of digital solutions with Yokogawa. He currently resides in Japan, so we appreciate him joining a little bit early on his time. Uh, and we compromised to join just a little bit late on our time, but we look forward to hearing from him. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to you now, Simon, for the presentation. Thanks very much, John, and thanks everybody for joining us today. So um, the subject of the presentation is towards autonomous operations of the hydrocarbon processing industry. That's the industry that I have uh, most of my background in. However, uh, I think many of the use cases that I'm going to talk about today apply to other industries. Um, so it's in, in particular the um, synergy between first principles, process simulation and uh, machine learning, but a, a little bit more general than that. The, the hydrocarbon processing industry is in, um, uh, in the middle of two very large changes, one, one being the energy transition. So how do we um, aim towards net zero emissions and address uh, climate change. Um, and the second is uh, the use of digital technology. So um, I've worked in information technology all, all of my career in, in um, the process industries. And I think this is the most exciting time in, in that time um, in terms of the technology that's becoming available to, to us to help address that challenge associated with the energy transition. So I'll, I'll talk about each um, area of, uh, of um, managing um, assets in our industry. So first of all, the, the, the design of assets and then uh, asset and value chain optimization uh, and then operations and maintenance of the asset. And in each case, I'll talk um, about some use cases of, uh, of artificial intelligence, which are relevant, uh, not just artificial intelligence, but digital generally. First, we, we generally start with a safety moment in our industry. So um, you may be familiar with this, with these statistics. This is from the Abnormal Situation Management Consortium. Um, and uh, it categorizes the causes of, of major accidents in, in the industry um, in between human error, equipment failure, and, and process related. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, the technology that I referred to has the um, potential to significantly address all, all three of these areas and to, to make a significant impact in reducing uh, incidents and improving safety. Um, simp simple things like procedural automation, so st automating startup, shutdown, grade changes, uh, decoking of furnaces, etc., cetera, um, can, can help with the, uh, eliminate human error. Um, Predictive analytics is one of the main uh, initial use cases of, of AI in, in our industry, and, and that can help warn of equipment failure, you know, weeks or ahead of, of when the equipment might otherwise fail. And um, uh, shutdown systems, of course, have been developed over 20, 30 years to, to uh, help address process issues, but also process analytics, so uh, similar to the equipment predictive analytics, you can apply the same thing to the process. You can identify when the process is going outside of its uh, operating window, uh, warn the operator ahead of time before the alarms uh, start to go off. And again, that can significantly Im impact safety, improve safety. So just a brief introduction about Yokogawa. Yokogawa is an automation company. Um, uh, we, we were founded in Japan about 100 years ago. And um, you're probably more familiar with companies like Honeywell because that's an American company, but that's one of our um, major competitors. Uh, and um, about five years ago, we purchased a British company called KBC, which specializes in consulting and process simulation in, in the oil and gas petrochemical industries. 
We also bought a company called Industrial Evolution, which is uh, was based in, well, partly in Houston and, and, and partly in Edmonton in, in Canada. That They pioneered um, data as a service, so putting um, process data, to collecting process data from, from plants, uh, uh, assets, and making that available in the cloud to particularly to supply, supply chain partners. And um, we also bought a company which is partly based in Houston and partly based in Argentina, which uh, pioneered uh, real-time optimization of utilities in, in uh, oil, gas, and petrochemical plants. So although I'm primarily going to be talking about uh, technology um, today, we always put that in the context of the overall objectives of our, our um, clients and, and the companies that operate in, in uh, the oil and gas space. And uh, many of them are have been implementing over the last few years uh, operational excellence systems. And we have a well-defined um, operational excellence model, which relates the business goals to the to the KPIs and, and, and um, financial objective, financial and other objectives. So um, maintaining the license to operate, of course, is a, a very important objective, but fundamentally trying to uh, increase the return on capital employed and, and profit. And there are, th there are th three main areas in this model. The first is optimizing the productions and, and, the, and the value chain. Um, and another is designing and improving the assets. So uh, starting right at the beginning of the asset life cycle. And, uh, and the last one is um, uh, asset integrity. So availability, maintenance, and maintaining the uh, uh, reliability of the of the assets and i'll talk briefly about each of these areas and um, uses of uh, artificial intelligence in each area our, our vision ultimately is to move from industrial automation which is uh, the, the area that we work in to autonomous industry or indus, indus, industrial autonomy so ia to ia um, by industrial autonomy we mean autonomous plants, uh, just like uh, a Google car or an autonomous uh, uh, vehicle. Uh, of course, in some industries like refining in particular is highly complex. So it's going to be many years before we get to true autonomous operation in the refinery, refining industry. But there are other industries like um, or other plants like uh, separation, where they're much further along this journey towards autonomous operations. Many of those um, plants run most of the time um, without intervention. And, uh, you know, all, uh, many company, every company is in a different place in this um, journey towards autonomous operation and, and towards digital transformation. Um, and these are, this diagram also shows some of the, the areas. So it's not just about technology, it's also about the people and the culture, it's about the business, um, business model um and strategy and business processes uh and 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 it's very uh, one of the things that uh, you need to start with is is the data um we have a lot we've always had at least since i've been in the industry a large amount of data which has not been um effectively used uh but organizing that data is 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 and always has been a a, a challenge so, as I said, I'm going to go through each of the areas that I mentioned in the operational excellence model, starting with the design and, and improvement of assets, um, and then optimization, and then operations and maintenance. So, um, we get involved in right at the beginning of um, studying the feasibility for, for new assets. And one of the tools that we use to do that is, is rigorous process simulation. And we generally use that uh, technology or, or our clients use that technology to increase the detail in the design from, from the initial uh, feasibility study to the front end engineering, to the detailed design uh, startup. Um, and then of course, also use it in the operations and maintenance of the assets. Um, increasingly people are, are now using 3D P and ID uh, technology. So uh, computer aided design, uh, and we can take that uh, uh, 3D P and ID data. Um, we can convert what we use in the feasibility study, which is a steady state model, 
into a, into a dynamic model, dynamic process simulation model. Um, and then we can use that dynamic model to do uh, startup and shutdown analysis, has op analysis, and uh, train uh, operators prior to the, to the uh, startup of the plant, and also to test the uh, control and safety systems. Um, and then, of course, we can, we can use the simulation, as I mentioned, for advanced control and optimization uh, uh, after the startup of the, of the plant. So we use uh, semantic uh, web technology. There, there are standards such as uh, ISO 15926 um, for the exchange of um, design data, asset data. And uh, we, we can read those as an XML schema and um, combine them with simulation data and use those to automatically generate uh, the dynamic simulation model. And we're also working on doing the same thing for the control and safety system design so that we can automate the control logic, we can automate the shutdown logic and uh, the operator interface uh, and the control database generally. And then of course we can also test it using the dynamic simulation. Um, that same semantic technology I'm going to talk about a bit later in terms of how to um, manage uh, knowledge within, within not just uh, the processing industry, but in, in general in any, in any uh, uh, industry. So it can be used to create uh, uh, knowledge graphs and uh, to, for engineering, uh, well, not just engineering data management, but enterprise uh, data management. Um, we can also use that 3D uh, design data to create um, a, a better representations of the, of the plant. We can either use the 3D design data or we can also, for existing assets where that's not available, you can use uh, lasers to, do, uh, to scan the, the asset and, and to create that uh, 3D um, uh, model of the, of the plant. And then that can be, th those graphics can be um, automatically enhanced to uh, and then connected to dynamic simulation models to allow the, the training of uh, field operators and also for augmented reality for operators in, in the field when, when, the, when the plant is, when they're actually in the plant. So moving on to um, optimization. So uh, in our industry, the, the, the technology that's been used primarily to optimize the value chain or supply chain is um, linear programming. That's been used for 40 years or so. Uh, and it's used from uh, annual plans, so, um, or even doing investment plans, determining um, what assets to build or how to configure those assets. Uh, annual planning, but then particularly for supply planning, so determining which feedstocks to buy and which products to make maybe three three months or more ahead of time because that's how long it takes to get uh, crude oil into this into some refineries depending on where where it's coming from and uh, and then production planning to on a more on a monthly basis to to determine how to process those feedstocks and and exactly what uh, products to produce. Those uh, plans are aggregated, so they assume that the operation is the same every day over that period, whether it's a month or three months or a week, whatever. Um, but uh, in reality, the feeds are arriving on a continuous basis or sometimes in large vessels uh, every, every day or every few days. And, um, and the products are also being shipped in batches. So... Uh, that plan needs to be converted into into a schedule, which is based on events um, and, and takes into account all of the logistics constraints associated with particularly the transportation of material in, in, into the asset and out of the asset. And, and then, um, so that's, be, that's being done on a daily basis and generally people are looking you know, two to three weeks uh, into the future, maybe a month into the future. Um, and then of course, after the fact, um, we need to compare what actually happened. We need to, first of all, account for what happened. So we can do our financial accounting, but we also need to compare that with um, what we planned and what we scheduled and try and kind of continuously improve. And the reality is that 
the tools that we use in, in, in each of these areas. So linear programming, I mentioned event-based simulation for scheduling and, and probably least squares for doing the data reconciliation and uh, production accounting. These technologies haven't changed significantly in, in the decades, uh, probably 30 or 40 years. And, and also they tend to be um, done in silos at so different teams within companies do each of these activities and no one has a very holistic view of exactly what's going on across the the value chain and also from a vertical integration perspective the amount of information that's sent from planning to scheduling and then to the real-time optimizers and advanced control schemes which are actually controlling the plant is limited um, simulation as it has been and, and and still is an important um enabler of of these processes so right from as i mentioned feasibility studies where more detailed simulation can be done to to check the um, um yields and, and energy consumption of any plant before it's you know, designed even um but then and through deep bottlenecking and and and, and continuous improvement of the assets but it's also simulation is also used to generate the models which are used in the planning and scheduling process so they're generally quite simple models used in planning and scheduling but they are uh, regressed versions of the of the rigorous first principle models usually and those rigorous models are sometimes used in um, online in uh, real-time optimization applications uh, as well so this process as i mentioned hasn't changed that significantly in 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 uh, 30 or 40 years um it, as i mentioned the planning and scheduling models tend to be um regressed versions of the rigorous models and quite often they're basically linear models and obviously um, the processes that which uh, we're planning and scheduling are, are highly non-linear it's also quite time consuming to update those models so often they don't get updated as as quickly as possible and this process of comparing what actually happened with what you planned is done quite often a month after the fact and um, often not done to the degree that uh, it could be just because again it, it takes a lot of a lot of time and the integration between each of the applications that's used uh, in in these work processes is is also a, a limited so um there are also in each area there are opportunities to uh, do better and and leverage the technology that's being developed um particularly by by companies like google apple microsoft etc um to to improve each of the in, in each of these areas uh, one example I, I mentioned briefly already is the use of uh, knowledge graphs so this is semantic web technology a knowledge graph is is um, the t technology that's used by Google and others to uh, organize all the information on the internet and to improve uh, the, your search when you do a Google search. There's uh, essentially a, a, a knowledge graph um, behind that search usually. Uh, also, in the in industrial internet of things. So we're starting to get many many more sensors we've always had a lot of sensors but there are now uh, much cheaper sensors which you can connect to plants using uh, 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 wireless and, um, and and that's bringing in even more information and then you combine that with video and with uh, unstructured uh, data uh, such as emails or web, uh, word documents etc so that management of all of that information is becoming more and more of a challenge so knowledge graph is, is one way to help with that of course we've always used uh, as what today would be called machine learning but in the past would just be regression of um uh to predict future demand future prices and and also increasingly the performance of, of the asset so how does the um uh the asset performance change um in in the next how are we predicting it's going to change in, in the next month or so? Uh, I, I already mentioned um, data reconciliation and, and variance analysis, uh, automating this process of maintaining the models and improving this, continuously improving this proce these processes of planning, scheduling, and, and uh, data reconciliation, automating the scheduling process, 
extending optimization the moment the state of the art is is an individual process unit optimization but we we can extend that to to the whole asset and uh, and then ultimately towards autonomous operations and thinking about cognitive um, operations and, and cognitive intelligence so just briefly a little bit more on the on the knowledge graph so this is a way of managing your data it's essentially a way of building a data model historically we've tried to create data warehouses in relational databases um, but i think it's fair to say that those relational databases have been inflexible and it's difficult to uh to to, to use those to manage all of the different types of information that we have um, so for instance in the context of, of a value chain you've got as i mentioned you might have excel spreadsheets quite uh, extensive extensive uses still made of excel um, you've got your sap data your, your erp data you generally have a database associated with your plans which is associated with a linear programming tool that you're using and then the same for the scheduling system and then you've got your actual production data and all of these are in different databases um, so you, you need a way to organize all of that information because in each database the same thing might be referred to in a different way uh, so it might be a you know a particular asset or plant or it might be a particular product or a customer or location or material and uh, what you can do with a knowledge graph is you can create that um, taxonomy of terms so that's a hierarchy of of, of the, all of the terms which are relevant to the value chain and then an ontology which is the relationships between between those terms and one advantage of using um, a graph database rather than a traditional relational database is that you can easily extend it and, and build all of those relationships uh, over 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 time and uh it's a very simple technology which is based on the semantic uh, web standards um, it also support helps to support natural language processing and uh, text mining and really start to get insights from from that data even if it's unstructured as i said it might be in operator logs or shift handover reports etc or maintenance records which are um free form uh, inputs by 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 the maintenance personnel of the operators this is an example of um uh the, an, an optimization application using uh, machine learning so uh in in this case that this is a crude unit on a on a refinery we um th that that crude unit is already has a multivariable control application but it it, that application does a good job of controlling the uh, yields from the unit, optimizing the maximizing the valuable products uh, up to their product quality constraints. But it doesn't have a lot of information about the um, energy because um, it's basically a linear um, model within that, uh, a dynamic model within that multivariable controller. And the heat integration is quite complex on a, on a crude unit between the distillation column and the preheat. Uh, train within the within the crude unit so we're using a machine learning algorithm trained on synthetic data from first principle simulation to determine what the the, the right uh, operating point is from an energy perspective so in, in in this case it's determining what the right coil outlet temperature is for the for the furnace uh, which is uh, feeding the distillation column and uh, also the stripping steam which is used uh, on for each of the products and and some pump rounds which are uh, heat integration and heat recovery uh, between the distillation column and, and the preheat train um, so we're using a simulation to determine what the optimum um, values are for these variables for lots of different types of feed in fact we analyzed two years of historic data for that uh, unit and um, determined based on those two years what would have been the optimum values and, and then we used um, we're using machine learning to to regress them and run that machine learning algorithm online based on the current feed quality it will determine what the uh, optimum operating point is uh, this is particularly focused on low energy uh, operation on the on the on the crude unit so as i mentioned we're it's a we're combining simulation and machine learning and we're using the simulation to create synthetic data there, there are a couple of benefits to doing that one is that the data is 
by def by definition it's heat and material balance so it obeys the laws of thermodynamics whereas the raw data often doesn't because there are uh, errors in the in the data and uh, measurement errors and and then um, secondly we can run the simulation uh, we can run an optimizer on the simulation and we can determine not only what uh, you know the current operating uh, point is but also what would have been the optimum um, operating point and then we can use the machine learning to regress uh, that data um, based on the quality of the feed and also the product quality targets that we're trying to make on at any particular type so that's an example where of combining first principle simulation and um, and machine learning another example of uh, of use of machine learning is to do this variance analysis that I mentioned. So the first step in that is to um, determine, you know, what happened yesterday. So you know, on a daily basis, you would do a, some, some form of production accounting, which is to determine exactly what you produced and how much inventory you have of each type of material. And um, uh, traditionally, that would just be a use, least squares um, algorithm in order to to balance the inputs and the outputs because obviously there are measurements error errors for both in the in the feed and in the in the, in the products um but uh that data but the, then we also want to compare that data with what we uh, expected to happen or what we scheduled to happen yesterday and also what we plan to happen over the say the month um and in, in the past even today in most cases the that comparison is mainly done a month later. And of course, by the time you do it a month later, first of all, you've forgotten what happened in the last month. And secondly, uh, uh, it's too late to, 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 to act on it. So this is something that you want to do on a continuous basis so that you continuously adjust your operation and you can continuously adjust your plan and schedule to take into account changes which um, happened, uh, uh, unexpected things which happened, for instance, uh, yesterday. And also you want to be continuously analyzing th those, that plan and the schedule versus the actual operation, you know, f over, over the last, you know, days, weeks, months, and years, um, to learn, to improve your planning process, but also of course, to improve your operation. And in, in a typical refinery, there might be you know, hundreds or thousands of variables, which you are planning and monitoring and uh of course it's not possible for a human to be analyzing all of those variables over over you know years to a couple of years so this is where uh, the latest machine learning technology can can really supplement uh, um, humans production scheduling is um, a simulation basically it's an event-based simulation so you uh, model the arrival of feedstocks like crude oil and uh, you, you model which tank you're going to put them you simulate which tank you're going to put put them in then which unit is going to feed from which tank and when the tank is going to change when it empties um, and then each of the process units within the refinery and then there's the blending is so those process units run continuously but the, those tanks of crude change maybe every day every couple of days and uh, and then the products the intermediate products are, are generally uh, fed into into tanks and then those tanks are blended into a finished product tank and that, again that that happens on a daily basis and in fact multiple tanks of different types of products are produced every day and you have to optimize the the recipe of each of those tanks and ideally you also want to optimize the mixing of crude if, if you do mix crudes which many refineries do you want to optimize the mixture to to um, get the best uh, yields of, of products to meet the demand so th this process as i said is a simulation on, on a planning level you you aggregate all of those tanks of crude and shipments are, are, of product and arrivals of feedstock over a whole month and then you can run a linear program or similar uh, mathematical program to uh, optimize the the right crudes to to buy and the right products to make but on a on, on a scheduling basis on a on a uh, based on these discrete um, log uh, operations and logistics, it's very difficult to do that optimization. So you're taking that 
kind of perfect optimum that you created over the month. And then you're trying to create that in, and, and turn that into a feasible schedule. And this is a time consuming process on a typical refinery. There might be five people doing this every day. And uh, uh, what they they don't have much time because it, when you run the simulation, you'll find, oh, this tank is going below its low limit. This one's going above its high limit or this product is off spec and uh, the schedulers have to adjust the schedule manually and rerun the simulation and, and uh, try and find a, a schedule which keeps all of the, the inventories within their limits and, and makes the, the right quality products. Uh, also, you know, minimizes the amount of time ships are waiting to either uh, offload crude or, or um, onload uh, product. So I think this is a perfect example, a perfect use case for reinforcement learning, actually. So reinforcement learning hasn't been widely used in, uh, in, in the industry. In fact, I haven't heard of any successful case of reinforcement learning yet within the industry. But I think because this is based on a simulation, it's a, it's a very good um, opportunity to, to use reinforcement learning to kind of automate this uh, uh, adjustment of the schedule, which the which the schedulers are, are doing on a, on a daily basis, um, and then sort of building on 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 those sort of the application of of the combination of simulation and uh, machine learning, and using semantic web technology like knowledge graphs, you can build these up and combine not just uh, machine learning but also uh, symbolic AI, which is the kind of more traditional. Um, AI associated with expert systems and so on, kind of rule-based AI. Bringing those all together, then you can start to move towards a autonomous plan, at, at least from the operation perspective, um, maybe not from the maintenance, because obviously that's going to require robots and so on. And, and there are applications of um, robots within, within the um, uh, industry, particularly for uh, inspection. So then finally, just talking about um, operations and maintenance, so I've talked a bit about value chain optimization and, and asset design, but moving on to the basic operations and maintenance. As I mentioned, predictive analytics for equipment um, have, has been the, probably the most widely used um, use case of machine learning. Um, again, you can apply knowledge graphs to organize all of your asset data. Um, uh, whether and 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 also combine your operations and maintenance records. So increasingly, people have their operator logs and shift handover reports um, in digital form, but they're free format uh, entries by the operators to some extent. And of course, they also have uh, maintenance management systems like SAP and Plant Maintenance or Maximo. And uh, again, a lot of the information in those databases is free format. Uh, entries by by the maintenance technicians so you need to use natural language processing and and that is assisted by organizing the terminal the terms which you which are which are used and, and maybe you can imagine that each person that's using a term might have a different acronym for the same thing so you, you need to associate all of those acronyms and terms so that you can apply uh, natural language processing to to those records um, yeah, I already mentioned equipment uh, condition forecasting, risk-based work selection and root cause analysis are, are key um, processes within um, reliability, availability and maintenance. And, and again, you can use natural language pro processing to, to help with that. So you can see, you know, based on this reported fault, this was in the historically, this is the action that was taken to uh, rectify that fault. And you can build up that knowledge base uh, over time and, and incorporate that into the knowledge graph. And you can use a similar technology to help uh, the operators to decide what action to take. And it, it could be based on a knowledge graph. It could also just be simulation. So you can run dynamic simulation in faster than real time connected to the, to the plant and uh, predict well, determine a bit more about what's actually happening in the plant and also predict what's going to happen in the future and, and, and uh, advise the operator and, and that can help them make the right decisions, particularly uh, during an abnormal situation, a disturbance in the plant. And then, of course, augmented reality, particularly for field operators so that they can uh, see what's actually happening in the field. Um, uh, you know, they can see well, while they're in the field, they can see what the temperature, pressure and flow is in, in the plant and they can bring up all of the... Uh, information that they need to help them uh, carry out their operator rounds. 
So there are a lot of um, standards. I already mentioned ISO 15926. There's also ISO 14224, which is a kind of taxonomy of all of the asset data. And uh, ISA 95, which is a standard associated with um, organizing manufacturing execution systems. So those historically have been paper-based uh, standards. And you know, we many of our clients, we have best practice work processes, which again, quite often are just uh, paper-based. So how do you bring all of those into the digital world? Well, I think that's where you can really leverage the semantic web technology and, and, and knowledge graphs to, to, to start to, uh, to get real, uh, much more value to those um, standards and best practices. So um, early anom anomaly detection uh, for whether that's for equipment or for the process is, is perhaps the most widely used uh, uh, example of machine learning. So this is, a, so how this works is you have multiple values. So that's the top part of this diagram. You've got kind of time series data, real time data, and some of that might be coming from uh, directly from sensors on the plant. And some of it might be, simulated so online simulation to provide information which is not measurable so in the distillation column you might be interested in the trade loadings or liquid vapor loadings in the column which you can't measure but you can calculate using using simulation or you might be interested in cat catalyst circulation or catalyst activity etc or composition of streams which you which you can't measure online so you can combine all of those and then you can build a a model of typical uh, values and again it, it could be you know tens or even hundreds of uh, values which you're combining into a, into a single model and then you can use uh, use that model to determine how far the current operating point is from the usual operating point and you can you might have multiple um, uh, operating points in which case you would determine which operating point you're in or whether you're in a you know an operating point which you've never seen before in which case or you've seen less before which would indicate that you, you may be moving outside of the normal operating window um we have a, a thing we call a sushi sensor which is shown on the left hand side of this this diagram it's a uh, wireless uses LoRa WAN, which is an um, unlicensed wireless spectrum. You can it can communicate over two kilometers, even within a plant environment, with all of the structure that's uh, in a plant. It has a magnet on the base, so you can just stick it onto a um, pump or a motor, and uh, it measures the acceleration, the velocity, and the surface temperature of of that equipment. And again, you can combine them into a single signal which is the red line on this on this diagram and uh, we, we've found that you can detect equipment failure up up to three months before it would uh, it fails and of course this gives you much more time to plan your maintenance and and also ensures that the equipment doesn't actually fail and uh, and that has a significant impact on on safety and of course also uh, profitability um, again, we've combined simulation and first uh, and machine learning to help advise operators when uh, 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 this is again a crude unit when when the unit is um, at risk of corrosion. So, for instance, at the top of a of a crude unit, you you don't you don't want to have the temperature below the dew point of the um, the overhead. Uh, product so the overhead product is a mixture of hydrocarbons and water because you're putting stripping steam in the in the column and if that water condenses then that that's a corrosion risk that's only one type of corrosion there are other risks as well and we can help to warn the operator to adjust the operation to um, ensure that we stay away from that uh, that danger of, of corrosion um, another machine learning example is uh, pumps um, you can use uh, even just use one sensor. So we have our flow meters, for instance, digital flow meters, they have multiple signals which are coming from that digital flow meter. So for instance, you, you have the flow measurement which you're using to control the flow, but then there's an unfiltered uh, measurement as well. And by comparing those two, we found that you can actually detect cavitation in a pump uh, ahead of when you would otherwise notice it. And again, this helps to protect the pump and, and uh, improve uh, safety. So 
often I'm, I've, I've taught many of the cases that I've talked about are this combination of first principle models that could be a, an asset model or an equipment model like a compressor or turbine um, or it could be the whole process you know the whole refinery or the whole uh, crude distillation unit or whatever combining those with machine learning we believe is the right approach to uh, using that uh, technology in in the in the process industries and there, there are many many use cases um, I, i've already talked about uh, the use of knowledge graphs and natural language processing to uh, get insights from your operation operating reports uh, shift handler reports operator logs etc and your maintenance records and you can also use that technology to to to, to um, create uh, best practice work processes, operating procedures. So for instance, startup shutdown or, or grade changes, each operator might be doing that slightly differently. You can analyze the logs within the control system and determine how each uh, shift or each operator is doing it and determine what, what is the best way. And then you can uh, automate that using uh, procedural automation. So I, I mentioned briefly the, the use of dynamic simulation online. So you're continuously running this first principle dynamic simulation model, you, initializing it from the current operating point. You're also keeping track of all the changes that have happened, um, either made by the operator, the control system, or maybe some disturbances like ambient temperature or feed quality changes. And then you're running the model to determine what the impact of those changes will be in, in the future. And this helps to tell the operator what's happening now because the simulator is calculating values which can't be measured and also predicting all of the uh, values whether they're measured or not uh, into the future and so it'll warn the operator that the plant for instance is going into an unsafe uh, area uh, potentially minutes or up to maybe an hour or so before it might it, it might trip an alarm and that gives the operator much more time to 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 react and again has a significant impact on safety we're starting to see devices like this used in the industry so this is a um, kind of heads up display like google glass if you like for for the for an operator in the field it's this particular case is android and uh the the um it's voice activated so it has voice recognition as camera built in as a microphone built in so you can uh, capture sound and video and also use it to and you can scroll around with your with your eyes it's actually quite quite clever and you can see uh, as you're going around your operator rounds you can uh, capture all the values just by uh, uh, using your voice and you can also see all of the information that you need to do your your operator rounds and uh, if you're doing maintenance on equipment you can pull up the the relevant um, procedures to to maintain that that piece of equipment and you can see your that what's happening in the process because it can be connected to the control system so you can see what the temperatures and pressures and flows are within the within the process um i think getting towards the end uh, so beyond those kind of uh optimization and asset management use cases the this digital technology has the um, potential to completely transform business models so one of our clients is a chemical uh, uh water treatment chemical supplier. So historically they would sell chemicals by the ton to their customers. Uh, now they can sell treated water by the ton. So they're selling the outcome, which is clean water, rather than the input, which was, uh, which was chemical. So they're using sensors to, uh, they're connecting to the, to the um, uh, process data on, on their customers' plants. We're, we're helping them do that collecting that data in the cloud and then they're using that to determine what the right amount of chemical is to um to to uh, to use in in the process and use it to minimize the chemical addition and and maximize the the, the treated water so uh, it's an example of a of a different business model so finally I've talked about um, the use of semantic web technology, knowledge graphs to support natural language processing and to really manage all of the information and the data that whether that's at the design stage or in the operation of, of the asset or th across the value chain. And then how to combine simulation with machine learning and then potentially symbolic AI, more kind of rule-based uh, AI to automate and uh, optimize uh, the assets in the value chain. and 
I think all of this requires the move to cloud computing so that we can get you know, all of the power that's available, unlimited computing power that's available, and also manage these huge amounts of, of data that we that we uh, have and different types of, of data, which is coming increasingly quickly because of technology like uh, IIoT, so more wireless sensors and so on. And we're moving towards um, remote operation and then auton ultimately to autonomous uh, operation of, of plants. So um, John did ask me to, to talk a bit about how I got started in, in, in this um, journey to uh, optimize plants. Um, so I started, I studied chemical engineering in Imperial, uh, John mentioned, and uh, then I started with KBC, which at that time was a very small company. Um, they were pioneering process simulation for, for refineries at the time. Actually, they, the three founders of KBC came from Exxon, so uh, where Kiran works. And um, uh, and then I moved into advanced control optimization, dynamic simulation for operator training. So OTS means operator training simulation. Um, and worked for different automation companies and also in supply chain optimization. And if I had the choice, you know, if I was leaving university today, um, I definitely would be looking at some of the AI startups, particularly those that are focused in, in the process industries. Uh, you know, also big companies are now getting involved in our industry. So Microsoft, or even Google, Amazon, um, and then of course, all automation companies like ours, uh, IT companies, they're doing, you know, a lot of work in machine learning and they work across many industries. And then, um, you know, biotech and pharma is obviously something for the future with, with all the developments going on with, uh, with genetics and so on, genome. Um, and also the, uh, the energy and chemicals industry, uh, although maybe refining as kind of thought on oil and gas are thought as a um, declining industry, the fact is that we, we need to generate energy and we need to find uh, new ways to generate energy in a cleaner way. And we need also, of course, to continuously produce chemicals and we need to do that in a clean and, and perhaps different way. So there must be opportunities in, in, in those two. So I went on probably a bit longer than I was was, was supposed to, John. But I'm oh, happy to great. take any uh, any any questions if anyone well, has any. I just want to say, open up your chat window because it's been very active with questions. I'm going to try to aggregate some of those uh, just for the the sake of of going through them. The first one that I I just kind of want to start with is um, you know kind of a a, a bigger view uh, question. And many of these digitalization portfolios seem to include drastic changes to the plant operations, infrastructure, and culture. In your experience, what is required to successfully transition to an autonomous, intelligent plant? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is uh, probably the thing which always has been underestimated. When you know, we tend to be as engineers, or at least I uh, tend to focus on the technical challenge and the application of a particular technology. You know, for instance, when I started, we started to implement uh, multivariable predictive control technology, which is now widespread. Um, but that requires quite a change in mindset for the operators, because historically, the operators would be adjusting the operating point and changing the set points on a, on a particular unit on a, you know, maybe not every minute, but every few minutes. And now with a multivariable controller, the operators don't uh, touch the plant. And so that's quite a big change in the mindset for the operator, actually. And, and we never really, um, we underestimated that. And what happened initially was many operators just turned the controllers off because they, they, they didn't believe it, right? They believed they could do better. And, and, uh, and they weren't really comfortable with sitting back and watching this um, controller doing what they had historically done. So, yeah, I think, I mean, in that particular case, what, 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 what we found you had to do was involve the operators right from the beginning. I mean, and, and in general, whoever the user persona is, um, uh, whether that's a maintenance technician or an operator and maybe multiple people, just get them involved right at the beginning in terms of even developing the ideas about how you're going to apply um, machine learning or how you're going to change this, use data, you know, kind of more data driven approach get them to come up with the ideas and then you know work with them to implement and develop those and and, and put them in, in 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 place and and i think then they um you know they they own it and uh and uh then you you kind of manage to change that way and then of course the other thing is from a 
you need to create a kind of grand vision. So we, we would, would suggest that when you apply in digital technology, you start big, I mean, you think big. So you have this vision, which might be autonomous operation, or it might be net zero emissions. So many of our clients are going you to know, have this challenge of in a decade or two to, to, to move towards net, to get to net zero emissions. So that's kind of your grand goal. And you get everyone on board on the need to do that, which you know, hopefully should be obvious to everyone. And, um, and then, you know, these things that we're doing are steps on the way and, and uh, you know, motivate that change. Great. I have a, a couple of specific questions here about how the machine learning models actually integrate with the APC. The you know, one concern is that incorporating nonlinear models into the controls operations and even optimization seems like it could far exceed the complexity of the linear models. And then another question on slide 17, you have an arrow that shows machine learning model to the APC block. So could you elaborate a little bit on how you do this and what are some of the challenges with using some of these new nonlinear models? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, we're, we're taking two approaches to that. Um, one is to uh, use the nonlinear models to um, update the models which are used within the multivariable controller. So we, we, we actually work with Shell and um, we jointly develop a, a multivariable controller, which is called Pace now. It used to be called Smock. Um, and... Uh, uh, so, and the, that latest, the latest generation of that technology has the ability to um, update the gains in the dynamic model, so the linear dynamic models, but you can update the steady state gain between the manipulated variables and the control variables, the inputs and the outputs of that controller uh, online without even initializing the controller. And so now you can start to add uh, nonlinearity, although the control, uh, control algorithm is linear you can update the models as and when you need to so when you change the feed quality or when you change the operating point significantly you can online update the the, the model so that's one one approach and then the other is you can well there are two others one is you can use uh, machine learning to, prov to to provide extra inputs to the controller so there are things like qualities generally we don't have online analyzers for all of the product qualities or feed qualities. So you can use, um, we have historically used statistical models, maybe semi based on first principles, uh, for instance, like pressure compensated temperatures on a trade temperature, which is a kind of um, indication of the quality on that, of, of the material on that, on that tray or that uh, with, um, product draw point. Um, and and you can make those more sophisticated with 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 better machine learning algorithms and those are used as inputs to the control uh, the, those are, uh, add extra control variables which you can which you can which you can add and then in this particular case what we're doing is we're providing better uh, targets so the controller still has flexibility to manipulate the coil outlet temperature for instance if it needs to to control you know, particular quality or to avoid uh, constraint in the furnace. So, you know, safety constraint. Um, but when it's already, when it's happy with the control and it thinks it's done the best job possible, then it will try and achieve the targets which are sent from the machine learning, which are based on historical data. Great. So advanced gain scheduling, inferentials, and target management. Yeah, perfect. Great. That's good. Yeah, so quick great. answer. I could, I could have done that much better, right? <laughs> no, that's great. That's a great explanation. Okay, so I want to get to kind of another point. I think that's on the back of everybody's mind about increasing automation and optimization. Uh, you know, in particular, you know, when you think about self-driving cars, we get into a car and it's connected to the internet somehow and, and could a hacker uh, get in there and be able to, um, with malicious intent, uh, do something uh, that would cause harm. But what about chemical plants and refineries? As you've talked with customers about this, what are some of the concerns and how do you mitigate those? Yeah, so, I mean, cybersecurity has been a, you know, a major concern, particularly maybe in the last decade, um, because there were examples of um, uh, malicious intent in 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 uh in our industry so there was an example i think was it tux stuxnet or something there was a, a virus that got into um an iranian uh, nuclear facility through a control system 
um, and you know, potentially it might have been America actually that created that, but or whatever. But, um, but uh, the and, and in in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, and in the Gulf states, they had a major virus problem in 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 the oil and gas uh, sector again about a decade ago. I, I, I don't know what the intent of that was but it it uh, had some impact on their production facilities not a safety impact but it did have a profit impact so that so the, there's been a huge focus on that and i think historically i mean until a couple of years ago the kind of working assumption was that the cloud would make that worse but i think increasingly now our major clients are starting to believe that cloud can actually be safer um, and so, and, and we have one client that's doing real-time optimization, closed loop real-time optimization from a virtual private cloud on Amazon web services. So they're actually sending set points to the advanced control from, from the cloud. And, um, the fact is that when you do, when you have on-premise systems, you've got, um, you, you, you don't have that connection to the cloud, but on the other hand, you have, uh, physical issues because people can interact with the hardware which they can't do when it's in in the cloud so you can make it a bit more secure you know because it's in these you know made huge data centers you don't know where it is anyway um and and secondly it's it's highly physically secure so, so many of our clients are now starting to believe that the cloud is actually potentially can be more secure than than client server on-premise systems great let's go with one final question many students on this call what advice do you have for them on things they can do to prepare for careers in data science, data engineering, automation, or any of these related fields part of this digital transformation or industry 4.0 that you've talked about? Well, I mean, what I've been doing, uh, you know, uh, I think that the technology is particularly at the moment. I mean, it's always a bit of a cliche that technology changes, you know, increasingly quickly, but I would say that, uh, you know, over the, my career since 1986, when I left university, the, the, the pace of change wasn't that dramatic. It was easy to keep up, really, from an from engineering perspective. But over the last uh, five years, uh, it, it, from, my, from my perspective, maybe I'm getting old, but it just seems like it's been going much, much quicker. And so what I've been doing, and I've had a bit more time because of the COVID-19 situation, not traveling so much, is to do online courses. I mean, one of the fantastic things about uh, modern technology is how much information is available, you know, to, to anyone. Uh, you know, I've, I've been using Coursera, but there are plenty of other uh, examples. And many, you know, universities, um, probably yours too, John, is... is um, uh, providing a lot of their content free of charge uh, available on, on uh, online and there's so much um, uh, available so i've been learning about uh, you know, machine learning generally um, and, and deep learning in particular using neural networks and then reinforcement learning because i think reinforcement learning has a huge um, potential it's, it's, it's some way off yet in terms of really using it in in, in our industry but i think uh, uh, that's got any, uh, that's exciting. It's just an interesting technology. So just learn more online, right? Fantastic, and and uh, I really appreciate your comments. You've done a great job giving an overview, but also uh, specifics about what you've done and and others are doing in the field. So really appreciate your perspective, uh, Simon. Thank you for uh, sharing some of your time with us and uh, and some of your expertise. I really appreciate that. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, stop now. Uh, and our next seminar will be uh, next week. And then we have a panel discussion coming up in a few weeks. We'll have four uh, members of industry who will be talking about a similar themes. So I'll be looking for that one as well. Uh, Simon, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the- Thanks, John. Thanks, thanks everyone for attending. Cheers.